Now we continue with the floor over here. It's Martin Kaiser <coughs> from the European Hematology Association that is having the next talk. He studied medicine in Aachen and uh, Berlin Charité. He's working as a hematologist at the Royal Marston NHS Trust in the UK currently. He's a leader of the multiple myeloma group at the Institute of Cancer Research and heavily involved in the European Hematology Association, which in addition to ESMO is of course a key organization involved in, let's say, also the EU HTA assessment and its new developments. Martin, thanks for joining. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, having me as a speaker. This is not my normal audience, as you can imagine, given the other roles that I have. But uh, I think I will use this opportunity as well to maybe take a slightly different perspective than what you've heard so far. I think I'm probably giving you more an, a perspective on maybe more of the human aspect of the process, which I think I completely appreciate uh, all the challenges everyone here in the room is trying to tackle on the technical side, which are having heavy implications, especially on the legal side. But I think there's a whole human aspect to all of this that we should not forget where organizations like ESMO or EHA can, of course, offer um, a lot of help and a lot of partnership as well, because I think this is needed um, very heavily to also get the message right in the long term for the electorate, I would say. So uh, uh, part of this is my lived experience. I trained in a system, as you just mentioned, where everything was accessible, and then I changed to a system where nothing was accessible. At least that was the narrative at the time, yeah? Uh, and actually, interestingly, the narrative that I also um, heard my colleagues where I trained say is we should not put a price on a, a life of a patient with cancer. And of course, I would say we've come quite a long way um, in that. Now, one of the things that I still feel, I, I've by now been a scientific uh, advisor, for example, in an HTA process, early on scoping and others, so I, I feel I have a certain qualification talking here, although I, I feel out of depth, of course, very quickly if you ask me on technical details, but it's these personal impressions that you have that suddenly shape and reshape your appreciation of the situation. One of these was that uh, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting Andrew Dillon, who some of you might know. He was one of the first CEOs of UK NICE and a very nice person um, despite uh, the reputation that NICE has had amongst physicians and actually I think what he said was very very stri striking for me because he said he was asked you know the, exactly that question didn't you have problems uh, effectively uh, applying uh, yeah technology or, or, or methods for HTA to decisions around patients. And he was actually saying exactly that in an email to me. Having spent 20 years as a hospital manager where everything was at the edge of bankruptcy, money was pretty much everything I was thinking about. So injecting some science and objectivity into decisions was a relief. And I think this is a very important message to get across to physicians. You know that you're not there to restrict, you're there to actually put something maybe on a more even keel that would otherwise be uneven. And I think the initial system, at least when you talk to the people that were designing it, was, was designed to incentivize actually the generation of more relevant evidence. And that includes more local clinical trials, more studies investigating how patients derive benefit, who benefits most, and also investigating the deliverability of treatments. So incentivization, genera generation of health data, but I think what is inevitable if you generate health data is you have to interpret it. And of course, although you're all involved in that and we have lots of other stakeholders and importantly patients who need to interpret it, I think you cannot quite get around the expert when you want to interpret data in terms of the healthcare professional who is actually somewhat the conduit to your patient. Well, has this worked well with just one or two countries doing HTA? Probably not. And I think this is where there's a massive potential, of course, in terms of the increase of the critical mass through EU HTA. But I think one should be very mindful that there is an increased demand and need for interpretation, and that meets, means expert interpretation, of course, as well. And I want to just give you a little bit of a perspective, you know, part of it lived experience as to how none of these things that 
I learned in medical school were preparing me to be a scientific advisor on an HTA evaluation. Yeah? So that's an important reflection. And why is that a reflection particularly in hematology? Well, I think it is particularly a reflection in hematology, hemato-oncology, but I'm focusing really on the hematology diseases here because many of them are uncommon. They're very diverse, they're uncommon. Uh, we, we're learning a lot about the technical tools that I think are very applicable when you have large patient numbers, you can run big trials, you have a lot of data around, but the moment that you come to uncommon cancers and rarer cancers, the situation becomes actually a bit more tricky. So you're suddenly dealing, if you're looking at it from the expert angle, uh, with experts who work in highly specialized clinics, and it's interesting in this field because it covers a lot of pediatrics as well. These are experts who are also delivering diagnostics, which is actually, in this case, I would say, an advantage and has been in uh, interaction with regulators and HDA bodies. Uh, they deliver this in HGM. This is hematologic malignancy diagnostic services. On the right-hand side, you see a nice picture. You know, those of you who have been in touch, you will see these cells look really, really evil and bad. Uh, and that's, you know, the same is true for the flow cytometry diagram on the lower side. And there has been a very strong and long-term clinical academic research network partly because of the allogeneic transplant, which I will come back to later, which has been a nightmare for some HTA bodies, but I think it, maybe in hindsight has led to some synergies uh, that were unexpected in terms of evaluation of efficacy of drugs. I think it has, it's fair to say there has been a certain engine of innovation in hematology, multiple firsts, maybe not literally that it was really the very first, but amongst the very first. Curative classical combination therapy a long time ago by now, of course. Cellular therapies, I would say, hematologists would say allogeneic transplant was the first cellular therapy. The first tumor genome sequence was actually acute myeloid leukemia patient, uh, and I remember that when I went uh, to the annual ASH conference at the time and that was uh, presented. The f one of the first targeted therapies, Gleevec, clearly was, you know, hematology drugs. Uh, some of the first monoclonal antibodies, the first ATMPs. And I think there has been a long, long culture of hematologists interacting with regulators for that reason, because the experience, of course, is needed here, even on a regulatory basis. Now, my specialty is multiple myeloma. I was actually thrilled to see that already appear on a slide earlier, because myeloma, I think, because it appeared, is it has been a nightmare for HDA bodies for ages. Yeah, it's a disease that, as you see here, has had lots of advantages and lots of progress, but it has actually anticipated, I would say, a lot of the challenges that we're now seeing across a lot of oncology diseases, particularly those that are turning from an untreatable disease to a treatable, but unfortunately chronic oncology entity. And as you can see here, there was hardly any treatment for a long time. Then there were actually, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, several proteasome inhibitors and cerebellum binders, also called, uh, named thalidomide derivatives, as many will, you will know. And I think lenalidomide, rightly, was one of the first drugs giving many HTA bodies around the world a big headache. And as you can see then, since 2020, uh, six new uh, marketing authorizations have been uh, approved, multiple ATMPs uh, by specific antibodies, T-cell and gauges. Prognosis has really increased. I can tell you lived experience. The outcome of patients is totally different now than when I even started my specialist training. Lots of these drugs are, however, combination therapies, and the drug costs increasingly have exploded through that. So this is something that I think one shouldn't underappreciate. Uh, Many hematologists carry around with them partly as a burden, yeah? And I think one should not take that, you know, just easily. But we are aware myeloma represents 1.6% of all cancer diagnoses. But we're also aware of what the spend is globally on the right-hand side. Globally, at most of this probably in high-cost drug markets, but certainly some of this also shouldered by public health care systems. I sometimes uh, have this slight mind game when I go through a, to a hematology conference to imagine what would be the number above my head of money that medications have been worth that I have prescribed since I started my practice. And I'm thinking how many multiples of that is my American colleagues maybe. But I think what I'm trying to say here is we are very conscious that we want to work together to find value propositions, but likewise we want to find value propositions that are really useful for our patients. And in a disease that has then suddenly 10 drugs, you're ending up with a treatment pathway. You're not just ending up with one drug being approved, but you have to think about they're all coming in some way of sequence. And that, unfortunately, sometimes ends up in a way that is not very patient-centric or can end up that way, and it's, it's a huge um, 
it's a huge mind um, um, uh, challenge in, on, in addition to everything that we have been saying. Now the thing, I think one of the key uh, um, partners that one can have are the experts and the expert hematology skills. And I think I try to reflect just on through my journey what you're really looking for when looking for an expert. So you want an expert who understands the unmet need, who benefits most the unmet need and who benefits most. So they have to have a knowledge of the rep representative patient population because they need to know how your population was probably subselected from the get-go in the trial that you're evalu evaluating. They have to have a really good knowledge of the disease heterogeneity, ideally an experience and data analysis in itself, and I will come to that. So you're actually nearly already ending up with academic hematologists, which is not easy. A technical understanding of companion diagnostics increasingly. Now, that is in a challenge in itself because it needs to know as well where are the diagnostic resources and what is the future diagnostic regulatory policy? Is this test still going to have a regulatory approval in five years' time? So I think then the big question that always comes, and I found the most challenging when I was involved in scientific advice projects, is the impact. So the impact on treatment on patients, the quality of life, the impact on daily activities, but also the impact on healthcare systems and their resources. And that's, of course, in some countries quite easy, where you have a single healthcare system, uh, like the one I'm working at at the moment. That makes lots of things far easy, but you have lots of systems where there's within system variability, between system variability anyway, and then there are even different incentives for maybe different healthcare providers within a system, some wanting inpatients, others not wanting inpatients, depending on how the reimbursement works. And that all needs a lot of knowledge, local knowledge. But I would postulate here for oncologists now and nowadays, a lot of the reason why we even exist still is that we know about long-term side effects of drugs. I would postulate you can give a lot of drugs relatively easily, but what you're really dealing with in a patient is the long-term side effects. And that really is a skill that will not be so easy to replace. So, but that plays an important role in the evaluation of a drug. And often that data on that long-term safety is actually quite limited still. And I would postulate treatment optimization intimately is related with deliverability of the treatment and cost effectiveness in the long run. So some of the examples here, how EHA is trying to engage in the discussions that are ongoing there already to improve the dialogue and somewhat hopefully contribute to policy is on the one hand side, a recent treatment optimization project, for example, with the European Medicines Agency called the Cancer Medicines Forum. And although it might appear to be sitting in a regulatory space, I think a lot of it is an anticipation, a very clever anticipation by EMA that the uh, marketing authorization process will soon come under more scrutiny when the question is, and what does that mean for access? So there is already a, a, a lot of thinking going in on there, and the medical societies uh, 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 like ERTC and uh, EHA are a part of that, and likewise the same is happening on the diagnostic side, to a large extent due to our uh, past EHA president, Elizabeth McIntyre, who has really been very vital in the Biomed Alliance. I think what is really then just to reflect on the individual expert that's sitting in front of you, one really has to understand here is the, how complex what you present them with is for that individual in terms of what they learned in medical school. You're suddenly asking them to horizon scan and anticipate unmet need. You suddenly ask them to anticipate demand signaling three or four or five years from now. You anticipate them to do all of that in the challenging, complex, fast-moving field. And in myeloma, for example, this is actually all of that within a pathway. There's a treatment before, and there's a treatment after, and probably three treatments after. That is not easy, because I would say, this is probably some of my colleagues would strongly disagree, but I would say, at least classically, when I trained, out-of-the-box thinking is not part of classical medical training. There's so many facts that you already have to absorb in that training that is often not how the training course is designed. So, and I think then there is a very important aspect here as well, which is actually the first-hand experience conundrum. And that comes back to maybe a bit of a personal uh, uh, feeling, but that the fact that long-term toxicity is really what you're after, at least half of your assessment that you want to know. And that makes it difficult, because how can you gather that when the drug in itself is actually inaccessible in your healthcare system at that very point? So the only experts that you can resource are early phase trialists. They have to be a very good appreciation which patients were excluded from the clinical trial that you're looking at. 
and how the effect of that drug would work in that population that is excluded. Or you have the chance of someone who has used the commercial access program or, and I have to admit that very openly here, you know, part of my experience comes from private care. I can just access the drugs already and I can probably sometimes feel I can get a better feedback to people who ask me about these effects just because I can use it. But that is very difficult and where, how do you systematically find these experts? And I think because we were touching on conflict of interest policies before, in, unmet, in uncommon cancers, one has to say, there are often very few qualified experts left, even if you have a country of 50 to 60 million, when you think this through, all of the criteria that we have talked through. So I think uh, EHA, for example, of course, is, has certain uh, advantages here in terms of uh, seeing and getting all of the feedback from the different parties that are involved in the process on the European level. Uh, so uh, EHA is a part of the um, uh, uh, EU HTA stake stakeholder network and is really uh, wanting to engage on all of the different processes here that I've, I've, uh, I've listed as a slide actually that Robin Doisbeck has kindly provided. And of course the interaction with the national societies is very uh, important, which, of which you will hear more. But I think it's a little bit getting the, the joint impression of what is, what, what is everyone struggling with is, is really the... Uh, or what are, the, what are the needs here on, on every single member state's level uh, that, that can be quite valuable. I think there's a general workforce development issue as well that I would like to highlight. As I mentioned before already, ideally you want to have someone who has already had some experience with data uh, analysis. That means you're kind of like thrown back to academic clinicians. And I think what few probably appreciate fully is these are often serving two different employers at the same time. So they have their clinical role and of course then the question is the time requirements for the HDA review and the short notice availability has to be really appreciated and there can be very different employers whether they see that as being the same level of urgency than the acute medical care they're providing is a big question. And on the academic side one just has to say it would be wonderful if we came to a different academic performance indicator system where HDA questions played some role because as you all know you will be asked whether you have published in Nature, you will not get an HDA paper into Nature, so actually you're then very quickly facing that question about job security or whether continuing on this path. And I would postulate I have had a number of very talented trainees Probably the majority that I would say would have been quality for an expert role in scientific advice have already joined industry by that point because they cannot face the reality of going through this system. So, um, and that's not a criticism of industry, it's just a reality of what we're lacking on the public healthcare provision side at the moment. So, a clearer formalized career path linked to HTA. Uh, is, in my view, required if you want to have the expertise there in the future and the workforce is anyway under pressure. And I think there are advantages to recognize the common challenges at a European level to plan for the advocacy. And that is actually something that a European uh, uh, um, um, community like the European Hematology Association can do in terms of collecting these voices and really giving a feedback of what the requirements are and how they could be addressed. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. I was unfortunately a bit late because the weather is not looking at that good anymore in London at the moment, but thank you very much. Glad to be here. <laughs>